While I was still in theological school, I took a summer class from Wesley Theological Seminary called Spirituality in Nature, taught by Dr. Beth Norcross. And on the first day of class, about a dozen students gathered in a basement classroom with no windows for spirituality in nature. <laughs> that simply wasn't going to work for us, so we took class outside that day. And once we got outside and gathered around Dr. North Norcross, she clapped her hands together and grinned and said, now I want you to meet your neighbors. And we thought that that meant introducing ourselves to each other, but no. She turned and briskly walked toward a tall, thick tree with patchy bark and giant leaves. Does anyone know this, is, this one's name? She called out, and we blankly stared back at her for a moment. Is it a sycamore? A seminary student from Texas asked. Yes, excellent. Now let's meet more of our neighbors. She waved us on to follow her to the next tree, the next neighbor, and we met many of the same trees and plants on the Wesley campus that you all have here at Fairfax. Oak, beech, tulip poplar, ash, redbud, dogwood, Japanese maples, fringe trees, black locusts. We made notes furiously in our journals and some of us became amateur artists trying to sketch the general shape of the leaves or other interesting aspects of the trees to try and help us identify them later when we met them again. It was a revolutionary thing for many of us to begin thinking about creation around us as our neighbors. Josh Whitten, founder of the Make Soil Movement, an online platform, explains that over 10 years ago, he decided to create a compost bin. He found two slats and some chicken wire and he made one, but not in his isolated backyard. He made it in full view of his apartment complex. And then he went around knocking on neighbors' doors. He said, hi, I'm just a single guy. I don't have enough food scraps but I heard this wild idea that we can turn our food into soil, our waste into soil. I've never seen it, but to be honest, the internet says so, so I was wondering if you might wanna contribute your food scraps and see what we could do together. You mean you want my garbage? Yes, just bring everything and let's see how far this can go, he said. Well, within a few weeks, he had more than a dozen people making contributions. I took care of the rest, he said. Over the next few months, all the food waste, the coffee grounds, the scraps, the pizza boxes, it all turned into this beautiful black soil. It was incredible. Whitten explains that making soil helps us to complete a feedback loop in our brains to actually see the outcome of our actions changing before our eyes, our food waste turning into regenerative, healthy, nourishing soil that will in turn grow healthy, nourishing plants, which remove the carbon from our air and help us create oxygen to breathe in, addition, in addition to feeding us. At the current rate of topsoil degradation, the UN says we have 60 years of farming left. We're demanding too much from our topsoil, and this doesn't need to be left to farmers to deal with. When people make soil together, the next idea they get is to plant something. If millions of people growing their own food, that makes a resilient food system. Making soil together is a beautiful way to build community. And there aren't many things we come together to do today that regenerate the planet. He says when we touch the living soil, it's full of microbes that communicate to our skin and our brain that the planet itself is alive. We go from feeling lonely to feeling that we're immersed in a living system. And it seems that together is the best way for us to move forward and save the planet. 
together in community, responding to human needs and creation's needs. But we cannot all respond in the same ways, with the same methods, because we exist in a broken system, on a broken planet. We have a lot of limitations to deal with. But take heart, resistance is not futile. We must continue to resist. A study on race and toxic waste in the United States resulted in a report that found that among a variety of indicators, race was the best predictor of the location of hazardous waste facilities in the US. 40% of the locations of hazardous, 40% of the nation's commercial hazardous waste landfill capacity was in three predominantly African-American and Hispanic communities. The largest landfill in the nation is found in Sumter County, Alabama, where nearly 70% of its 17,000 residents are black and 96% are poor. Knowing that our fate and freedom is bound up together, Professor James Cohn known as the founder of black liberation theology, writes in his article entitled, Whose Earth Is It Anyway? The fight for justice cannot be segregated, but must be integrated with the fight for life in all its forms. Dr. Crone challenges us not to only see creation his holistically, but to see the fight for justice holistically. We desperately need each other in the struggle for justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. Martin Luther King Jr.'s idea of beloved community is a potent symbol for people struggling to build one world community where life in all its forms is respected. All life is interrelated, King said. <coughs> Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. There is an interrelated structure of reality. And we echo that message in our seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Dr. Cohn asks us, whose problems define the priorities of the environmental movement? Whose suffering claims its attention? Do environmentalists care about poor people? Now that humanity has reached the possibility of extinction, one would think that the critical assessment of how we got where we would, where we are, would be the next step for sensitive and caring theologians of the earth. He says, if we save the planet and have a society of inequality, we wouldn't have saved much. The earth is not a machine, it is an organism in which all things are a part of each other. Dr. Cohn urges us to deepen our conversations by linking the Earth's crisis with the crisis in our human family. If it is important to save the habitats of birds and other species, then it is equally important to save black lives in the ghettos and prisons of America. The late Representative John Lewis of Georgia said that working for clean air and clean water is just as important, if not more important, than anything he has ever worked on, including civil rights. Creation is not just the gentle meadow near water where the poet Wendell Berry lies his weary head. Creation is not just the delicious backdrop of a Mary Oliver poem. Creation is a living organism that breathes and speaks and grows and dies and changes. But most of all, creation calls us to follow the living pulse, to respond to the cries of creation with a life-giving, creative energy. Joanna Macy, an environmental activist, author, and scholar of Buddhism, systems theory, and deep ecology, identified in her work a spiral that maps our journey into deeper connection with the earth. She describes this spiral in four stages. Coming from gratitude, 
honoring our pain for the world, seeing with new eyes, and going forth. And I'll go into each of these. These four stages support one another and work best when experienced in that sequence. They help us experience firsthand that we are larger, stronger, deeper, and more creative than we have been brought up to believe. The spiral is fractal in nature, she writes. The sequence can repeat itself in many new ways, even within a particular, particular stage of that spiral. The spiral can be discerned over the span of a lifetime or a small project. And it can also happen in a day or several times a day. We come back to this again and again as a source of strength and fresh perspective. The spiral begins with gratitude. Because the quiet, gratitude quiets the frantic mind and brings us back to the source, stimulating our empathy and confidence. It helps us to be more fully present and opens psychic space for acknowledging the pain we carry for our world. And in owning and honoring our pain and daring to experience it, we learn the true meaning of compassion to suffer with. We begin to know the immensity of our heart-mind. What had isolated us in previous anguish now opens outward and delivers us into the wider reaches of our inter-existence. Experiencing the reality of our inter-existence help us see with new eyes that third step. We can sense how intimately and inextricably we are related to all that is. We can taste our own power to change and feel the texture of our living conditions with past and future generations and with our sibling species. Then again, we go forth into the actions that call each of us according to our situations, gifts, and limitations with others whenever and wherever possible. We set a target, lay a plan, and step out. We don't wait for a blueprint or a fail-proof scheme, for each step will be our teacher bringing new perspectives and opportunities. Even when we don't succeed in a given venture, we can be grateful for the chance we took and the lessons we learned. The spiral begins again and again. There are hard things for us to face in our world today if we want to be of use. Gratitude, when it's real, offers no blinders. On the contrary, in the face of devastation and tragedy, gratitude can ground us, especially when we are scared. Gratitude can hold us steady for the work that must be done. I close today with the classic words of Alice Walker. I think it pisses God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't notice it. People think pleasing God is all God cares about, but any fool living in the world can see it's always trying to please us back. Looking outside today, I can say I am truly grateful for all the colors. I see you, God. Thank you. I see you, Mother Earth. Thank you. I see you, creation. Thank you. And may creation live. Amen.